So in Matthew chapter 24 tonight, of course, a very familiar chapter for probably uh, most of us, if not all of us, um, chapter dealing with the end times, dealing with prophecy, dealing with the return of Jesus Christ, and a great chapter, uh, a chapter that really changed the course of my life. I know when I first came to this truth and understanding of the timing of the rapture, um, it really gave me a new perspective on, on how I ought to be living my life, and that's really the admonition that we see in this chapter. Uh, especially towards the end, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But just right out of the gate there, of course, we're just going by verse by verse. So uh, in verse 1 it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his, uh, his disciples came to, hear, uh, came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So I kind of wonder whenever I read this, I get a little bit of a chuckle that, you know, they're trying to, it seems like, kind of impress Jesus with the building, and they're trying to show him, look how great and marvelous these things are. And you really wonder, is this the reaction that they expected to get out of Jesus? You know, he just says, he doesn't move and all over it. He says, well, you know what about these buildings? They're going to be cast down. There's not left one stone be left upon another. <laughs> And it really just shows us that Jesus is not impressed by the works of men. Yeah. You know, and men have a real, uh, we, you know, we can be impressed with one another often. We, we look at, you know, I remember when I worked downtown in Phoenix and I was surrounded by all those buildings and I worked in the convention center even. To this day, I'm flying back on uh, Monday, coming back from Sacramento. I'm looking down at the, the building I used to work in and I'm like, that is an impressive facility. You know, we would be impressed with some of the buildings and the structures that we can make. But God is not impressed. I mean, none of that is really going to impress him. And we see this even in churches. Men get obsessed, you know, obsessed with building these lofty structures and filling it and making everything so beautiful. And they, they really just become, well, it seems like oftentimes they put the emphasis on that. Yeah. You know, they can let a lot of other things go if they have a nice building. You know, if they have, you know, the tongue and groove, you know, wood and the right stain and the beautiful carpet and the nice pews and the great big vaulted ceilings and the organs and the orchestras and everything else. And those fun things are fine and great. And of course, they help to bring glory to God. We're not against those things, but what we have to be careful is not to think that God is somehow impressed by those things. But what really is going to impress God is that, is that when we're doing the works, if God can look down and see a group of people, no matter where they're meeting, if they're doing the works that God has given them to do, that's what's going to impress them. That's what's going to stir his heart. That's what he's going to take note of. Right. And uh, you know the proof of that is, if we were to go back, we won't go there for the sake of time, in 2 Samuel, when, they, when it came into David's heart to build God, the temple, he said, you know, that never entered into my mind. He said, you know, uh, in, in all the places where I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with thee of any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, why build ye me not a house of cedar? He said, you know, God was half, perfectly content with his, his tabernacle, the tent that he had for the ark, and, and, and was just fine with that. But God did say it was a good thing that it was in thy heart to build me a house. But, you know, that's not where God puts the emphasis. Those things are fine, but we have to make sure we don't forget a lot of times. And I've seen this happen in ministries where they build a structure, they go out and they buy 10 acres, and they have a huge parking lot, and they've got enough, you know, I'm talking 12,000 square feet. You know, that's a huge building. Wow. But there's 12 people inside on All Wednesday right. night. You know, there's enough people in there to each one have built a you know a twelve hundred square foot home in there, yeah. and, and that's that's just overkill. And why does that kind of thing happen? Why do these great big structures just suddenly become empty? It's because the spirit of God has departed. You know, don't let a, a fancy building you know fool you to think the point where God wouldn't just say Ichabod. You know, this, you know, if they're not doing the work, if there's iniquity found there, or if, if the emphasis is put on something else, God will depart from even from the most you know, grandiose structures that man can build. God is not impressed by them. And that's really kind of what I see just jumping at me right out of the, the, the gate here whenever I've read that. You know, God is just not impressed with man's structures. Amen. And really, he says here that the, the stone shall not be left one upon another. And that prophecy was fulfilled. That wasn't just Jesus, you know, you know, trying to be overly dramatic. That literally happened when the Romans sacked uh, Jerusalem in, in 70 A.D., you know, they tore all those stones down of that structure. It all came down. And, you know, the, the, the Jews over the day at the, at the so-called Wailing Wall, you know, that is not the temple. And they'll, some folks will say that is, that's one of the last remaining walls of the, of the second temple. Well, then Jesus is a liar. Yeah, right. You know, and you, and you could go on YouTube if you want. You could watch all of the, the videos that explain why that, is, that it's not the second, uh, it's not a wall of the temple. You know, there's a lot of people that have gone through and done detailed studies on that. 
I have never done that because I just believe the Bible. Amen. Because I just believe what Jesus said. You know, I believe that what Jesus said came to pass when, when that happened is that uh, you know, when they sacked uh, uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD, it happened just like he said it would. They took down every stone and there's not one left upon another even to this day. So that wall is a fraud over there today. But we don't want to spend a lot of time that out there's a lot of meat in this, in this chapter we need to get into. And it says here in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that man, no man deceive you. So it's interesting that before Jesus even begins to give an answer, he gives a word of warning first. He says, look, before I even begin to answer your questions, before I even begin to explain to you when the end of the, uh, one of these things shall be, the first thing you need to understand is to be take heed and let no man deceive you. Amen. And what that should tell us is that there's going to be a lot of false teaching on this. Okay. And he said, be aware that no man uh, teach you or deceive you. You know, take heed. That's something that we have to be on guard about. And, and we see it today, especially in American churches, where this, pre, this false doctrine, and it is a false doctrine, of the preacher of rapture, has just, it is the popular doctrine. Yeah, right. I mean, it has taken over churches. I mean, people, there are whole books being written about it. Everybody, the vast majority of Christians that I know in America believe this. But that's not to say that there aren't people out there that, that reject it. There are. There's plenty of them. And we're not saying, you know, here's the thing. We get accused of, oh, this is some doctrine that, you know, we made up as a church. So, you know, Pastor Anderson got, may have cooked this up. This is a doctrine that's been believed by Christians since the days of Jesus Christ and, and prior to that. This is a very, there's millions of people that believe right. in a post, uh, pre, uh, excuse me, post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but there's so many just false doctrines that go around. There's so many twisted, you know, teachings that about this, uh, the return of Christ and, and, and and really, the pre-trib one is probably the one we're most familiar with. And really, the difficult thing about the pre-trib rapture is that you have to understand what they believe before you can really debunk it. And a lot of pre-trib people, they don't even understand exactly. Yeah, right. You know, I've heard it said you have to teach them what they believe before you can debunk it because they don't even understand fully what they believe. Now, and I'll say that's true because I went to a church where the pre-trib rapture was taught and you know, it was never a big thing for me. I just kind of went along. I was like, okay, I guess if that's what you say. I never, but it was never taught. It was believed. But it was it was it was alluded to. Sure, yeah. It was mentioned, but the pastor never sat down and said, "Let me take the Bible tonight and right. show you why yeah. the pre-trib rapture." Right. Is the truth. That never happened in over a decade of sitting in that church. Yeah. Because they can't. I remember the one time you went through the Book of Revelation with a pre-trib view. It was the most confusing, garbage <laughs> mess right. I've ever heard. And they can't. You know, it just messes everything up. You get one little thing wrong in doctrine, and it just everything else starts to fall apart. And that's the way it is with the uh, pre-trib rapture. So Jesus warns us, is you know, not to let any man deceive you. And a lot of people today, unfortunately, have been deceived, and uh, it's unfortunate. You know, a lot of people, and they just uh, they just go along with it like I did. They just say, well, you know, that's just what my pastor believes, or that's what my church teaches. I don't really understand why. They just kind of swallow it. I've even heard Baptist preachers get up, not get up, but come to me privately and say, hey, you know, I just go along with the preacher of rapture because I don't want to make any waves. I, I just go along with it because I don't want to cause any contention. They just, they'll just say, yeah, I'm pre-trib because they, they know it's not true. But they'll go along with it because their Bible college teaches it. Because it, it's, it's one of the strangest doctrines to be run out of, on a rail on. You know, if you, if you come out against it, it's just like you're anathema. You know, they yeah. just, you're blacklisted. Yeah. They want, you're done. It's you're you're going to get kicked out of certain circles. You know, the, the Bible college you've graduated from is going to pull their, their uh, you know, their, their uh, doctorate from you. They're going to denounce you. You're going to, and you're just going to be a loner. You know, well, more and more, there's plenty of people that, and that's why it's hard to make that, that transition. A lot of people, they, they really study these things out, and, and, and it's hard for them because they know the backlash that's going to come if you come out against the pre trib rapture. And it's, a, and it's a dumb doctrine to kick people out. I mean, you could come to this church and be pre trib. You know, right? <laughs> if, you, if you are, you know, there's a movie you need to watch. <laughs> a couple times, maybe. But here's the thing we don't run people out of church for being pre trib, they're welcome here. You know, Amen. it's just, uh, you know, but they, it's not it's not the other way, though. If you go to some of these other churches, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of churches, if you go to them and you tell them, hey, I don't believe in the pre-trip rapture, I mean, you might as well just deny the deity of Christ to them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that is the most blasphemous thing you could say. And the reason why is because, and we'll get into it, is because a lot of people, they don't want to deal with the reality mm -hmm. of what it means when the pre-trip rapture is, is yeah. false. But, uh, you know, Jesus starts out with a warning, and that warning is reiterated in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you want to turn to 2 Thessalonians, of course, keep something in Matthew. When you get to 2 Thessalonians, keep something there too. 
we turn away from it because we will be coming back to it. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, Paul reiterated the same warning in verse 3. He said, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, the son of perdition, be revealed. So, I mean, there again, that, that same, when it comes to this, this, do, this doctrine of, of, of the second coming of Christ, when it deals with that, we see that well, we're given warnings to not be deceived, which tells us that there's going to be a lot of deception around it. And we can start to understand why there is. When we start to consider, you know, the, uh, the, the, that Satan is going to try, he's going to bring in a one world government, he's going to set up his antichrist, that he's going to try to bring the whole world into, you know, subjection to him. He's going to, how is he going to accomplish all that? He's going to accomplish that through deception, through false doctrine, and that's why we need to take heed. Now back there in Matthew chapter 24 and verse uh, 5, <laughs> he says, why we need to take heed? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And we see that even today, there's people, I think there's a guy in South America that claims to be Jesus Christ, yep. you know, in, in the second coming of you know, God in the flesh. That Maybe not Jesus, but they'll say they are the new incarnation of God and all these different religions. So that, that lines up. He said in verse 6, And you shall hear wars, uh, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So Jesus, you know, he gives a warning, and then he kind of goes into it like saying, look, things are going to get bad before they get better. You know, when the second coming of Christ, we all love the, the idea of that if coming, of course, we desire that. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But we have to understand that there's a lot of bad things that are going to take place mm -hmm. before Jesus gets here. And there's a, you know, not, but that's not reason for us to be worried, or as he says here, to not be troubled. We are to not be troubled. We should not worry about these things. You know, if we're, if we're safe, uh, faithfully serving God and, and we're found in the will of God and we're, and we're right with God, you know, He's going to protect us. He's going to watch over us. And maybe Amen. even miraculous ways. I mean, Amen. you think about when Elijah, you know, escaped from Jezebel and, and, and Ahab and he was told to go by the, the brook and that ravens brought him his meat and, yep. and, and God took care of him and he went to the widow and the cruise of oil and all these miraculous things that God did when He was providing for His people. So, I mean, that be, that should give us, you know, uh, a cause for excitement, not worry. We should be even more excited about the fact that the wars of war, or wars of rumors of wars, and the things that are going to begin to take place. You know, instead of being troubled, maybe we should try to be a little bit more excited about the fact that uh, you know Christ is coming, and yeah, these things are going to happen. But maybe that just means we're going to get to see some amazing things. Amen. Right. And if we find ourselves often more worried and biting our nails over it, maybe we need to examine our hearts. Maybe we need to say, well, maybe there's some area in my life or something I'm not right with God. Maybe maybe you should be worried. You know. But, <laughs> Ideally, we would not be troubled, right? If we were right with God, we would know that God is going to take care of us. Now, when we're trying to, again, we're trying to unravel this false doctrine of the pre trib rapture, it can be a very complicated process, so I've tried to just boil it down tonight. And really, instead of trying to just take on the pre trib and, and, and go through all that, what I thought would be best is just to look at these verses and see how they compare with Revelation chapter 6 and just show you how simple it is to show to see the timing of the rapture. When is it? I mean, that's really how you debunk that whole thing. It's just like, well, what does the Bible actually say? You know, and the, instead of trying to figure out all of the mumbo jumbo, because they get into dispensationalism, and yep. all these. I mean, it would just be a, it'd be a series of sermons to try and unravel that. But often, if we just go to Scripture and see what it says, and just take it for what it says, you know, we can quickly understand the truth, and we can see what is false and what is right. <laughs> so he says there, you shall hear wars of rumors. Of, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So, if you would, keep something here, but go over to Revelation chapter 6. And what I want to do is just start to take these next verses, verses uh, 5 through 15, and show you how they line up with Revelation chapter 6. Because really, to me, that's the most clear-cut way to prove yeah. a, a, a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture. And again, what we mean by that is a tribulation that comes after the tribulation, but before God pours out His wrath on the earth. So first of all, we see the first seal, right? We see that there, as I just read to you from verses 5 in Matthew 24, that there will be wars, war rumors of wars. We'll look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, a noise of thunder. One of the four, four beasts comes, uh, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So here's a man that's being given a bow to go out. Of course, this is talking about the Antichrist. He's going to go out and conquer. So this is your wars and rumors of wars, right? Now look at uh, 
Matthew, if you, you got to kind of flip back and forth with me tonight. So we'll look at the second. So you look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 2. It says in verse 7, I'm sorry, look at Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So you see the rumors of wars, you know, the Antichrist going out, you know, and he's, and he's making war. He's going out to conquer and, and, and forth. He's going forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. And this is going to result in even more war. So you see verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This is talking about all out war. Where there's going to be different factions, I and mean, we can think about World War One, World War Two. Well, allies are getting involved, nations are aligning themselves, and right, rising up against other ones. That same type of thing is going to play out. And it says in uh, Revelation chapter six, verse three, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, "Come and see." And there went out another horse, and was red, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And, and there was given unto him a great sword. So we see the wars, the rumors of wars, right? With the Antichrist going forth to conquering and to conquer. And then we see the escalating to that second seal where nation is rising against nation, where he's taking peace from the earth. You know, now that all these nations are at war with each other, there is no peace on the earth. <clears throat> and then, of course, we progress into the third seal. And it says there in uh, uh, Revelation, uh, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 continues, and it says, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now that would coincide with our third seal in verse uh, Matthew, excuse me, Revelation chapter 6, verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the, ba the beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he, sat on, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of, uh, of barley for a penny. And see that you heard not the oil and the wine. So you see these exorbitant prices on food, which when we you know, understand the law of supply and demand, meaning food has become very scarce. And that would be your famines and your pestilences. Those are your diseases that are going to take place. Which is, uh, you know, so we can see how these things are all lining up with Revelation perfectly. And we'll get into the timing, you know, this is all kind of building up to, okay, well, when does Christ come, okay? So what we see so far that these are lining up, that the seals and what Jesus is describing are lining up, you know, successively. You know, they're they're back to back. It's 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 uh, congruent. They they match. So look here at uh, in Matthew 24 verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. You know, and so that's going to be your fourth seal, which back in Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. And when he opened up the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and he followed and with him, and the power was given to him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So that's tying in more with, uh, you know, verse, uh, uh, verse 7, where you see the famines, the pestilences, the earthquakes. And then, of course, the fifth seal there is kind of the results of all these other seals that have opened up. We've seen peace taken from the earth. We've seen the Antichrist rising to conquer. We see the, the famines coming. We see the pestilences, the diseases, all these seals being let out. And then the fifth seal kind of describes the results of everything that takes place. And it says there in verse 9 of Revelation 6, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. So we see that while this is all taking place, while these wars are going on, that God's people are going to per be persecuted. And that's why we're seeing them slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And of course, that's tying in, in again with exactly with what Jesus said there in, in Matthew chapter 24, where he said, They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Right. So we see that's what's taking place. And so again, this is all just lining up perfectly. It's all making sense. This is not difficult to follow. He says in verse 11 of Revelation 6, And white robes were given unto them, uh, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So here's the thing. This should be a big red flag if you believe in a pre trip rapture. Because if the pre trip rapture is true, who are these people? And why are they being killed? Shouldn't they have been raptured out? Shouldn't they have not been there to be killed right. in the first place? I mean, if the preacher of rapture comes before these seals, and, you know, then they wouldn't have been there to be hated of, of, of all. You know, it, it would have made no sense when Jesus said that they shall, many shall be offended and shall hate one another, yeah. and they shall deliver you up and, and kill you. You know, well, I thought we weren't going to be here. How can that be? Yeah, right. How can we be delivered up and killed 
if we're not here. So, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but we do see how uh, it's lining up with what Jesus said, and we're going to see here in a minute, Amen. how it lines up with the fact that Jesus comes after the tribulation. So, <clears throat> it goes on in verse 11 of Matthew 24, And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And, you know, of course, Jesus admonishes them at the end of this chapter to, you know, even as the fig tree bringeth forth fruits in the season, you know, you know, we are to discern the times as well. We are to know when these things begin to come about. And he likens uh, also elsewhere that it is like the birth pains of a, of a woman when a woman is about to be delivered of a child, that, you know, she goes through those labor pains. And that's a lot of what the end of the world is going to be like. It's not, all, it's not going to all come at once, but we will see things begin to build up. And we will start to see signs. You know, we'll start to see these things, with, uh, maybe not on, the grand, on that scale that's going to take place, but we can see how things are going to escalate. You know, and this is one of them. When you, when you read there, he says, uh, The iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. And, and boy, if that isn't the truth today. Amen. I mean, we just see iniquity beginning to abound. I mean, we're sitting around here talking tonight before the service about... You know, Pastor Grayson Fitz is on the news out there, and the, and the, and the, the, the fags are just raging right now against him in the Massa conference, and it's Pride Month, you know, we've got rainbows everywhere, and they're out and they're proud, and they're, you know, they got their cartoons with their, their, their fag uh, characters in it now. Huh. You know, it's iniquity. Yeah. It's abomination, yeah. And, and the world is embracing it. And what do we see as a result? That the love of many is waxing cold. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, they love one another, but they hate God's people. And they hate the Word of God. They hate uh, truth and righteousness. So we can see how these things will escalate. And I don't want to go off a rabbit trail there. I'm trying to kind of keep the flow with this one. But it, it says there in verse 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy, post, the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let, them, uh, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are of a child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And I've heard somebody say, well, why is it the Sabbath day if we don't observe the Sabbath? Why is he even mention that? Because you have to understand that this is a dual prophecy that Jesus is giving here. He's talking not about only the end of the world, but he's also talking about when, when not one stone shall be left upon another. The day when they come to sack, you know, when the, when the Romans were going to come and, and destroy Jerusalem, so that they did have the Sabbath day then, right? So that's part you have to kind of understand sometimes that there's a dual prophecy being given here, and that's why the Sabbath day is brought up. You know, for us, we would probably be more concerned about winter. Well, not us because we're in Tucson, but you know, we'd be like, winter, yay! It's perfect time for tribulation. Right. You, know? <laughs> you know, don't bring in the summer, Lord. But uh, you know, he's just kind of. That's why that's there. That's why the Sabbath is brought up. <clears throat> and he says, uh, and then it says in verse 21, For then shall be great tribu tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. I mean, this is why it's so important that we're not de deceived on this. This is why it's so important that we have an understanding of, of when Jesus is truly coming back. Because if we don't, we're not going to be ready for that. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be caught off guard, they're going to be discouraged. They're going to be downhearted. They're not going to know what's going on. They're going to be deceived. And, you know, they're not going to have any hope. And they're going to go through one of the worst times on, to live on the face of this earth for mankind. And, uh, you know, but we shouldn't have that. You know, we should watch and pray and understand these things. And he says in verse 22, And except those days shall be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the flesh's sake, there sh those days shall be sort of shortened. I mean, no flesh shall be saved. I mean, he makes it sound as if, you know, mankind would just destroy itself. And of course, we can see how that's possible today. I mean, with the nuclear arms and things like that, and, the, and the <clears throat> all the uh, different uh, methods of waging war today, how men could really, we could just wipe each other out very easily. <clears throat> now, you can't read that verse without pointing out, it says there, um, except those days to be short, there should no flesh be saved. And well, I, I'm thinking of a different verse, so it'll come up later. So, but he does say there, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be short. Now, this is kind of one of those points where the pre-tribbers will say, aha, see, all this is referring to the Jews. And that's what this, uh, you know, the tribulation is for the Jews. That's why it says it's for the elect's sake. We're going to be taken out of here. And everything that's taking place and all these people that are under the altar, crying about the fact that they didn't kill and they're being delivered up and men are hating them for his sake, it's because those are the Jews that are getting saved. You know, those are, those are God's elect down there, you know. 
And uh, but that's not the case. You know, these are not talking about this is not talking about the Jewish right. so-called yeah. nation of Israel. Right. right. What the elect is actually referring to is believers in Christ. That's yeah. what you know the word elect means. Yeah. You know, who is the elect tonight? We are. Right. You know, yeah. We believe yeah. in Christ if our faith is in Him. And you know, there's a lot of scripture that's really a real easy word study to just put in elect and go read the New Testament and see what it has to say about it. You know, and there's gonna be verses like Romans 8, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 1. There's gonna be a lot in there that you could just read and see very clearly that we are the elect. You know, and uh, I don't, you know, I'll just give you one instance in 1 Peter 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered through Pointus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Not exactly you know, uh, a Jewish nation. Right. You know, these are Greek. These are, um, you know, these are the Gentile nations right. that they were sent to. And then he says this, you know, comma, verse two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You know, yeah. that's who are the elect. These, these uh, uh, Gentile nations. <laughs> you know, he admonishes in Colossians. You know, he says there's neither Jew nor Greek, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free. But Christ is all, and it all put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Who is the elect? It's us, those that believe in Christ. So that that false doctrine falls flat on its face. It's cut short very easily. You can't say that when he's saying, uh, you know, the elect's sake, you know, those days are going to be short. And that's referring to the Jews. No, that's referring to God's people here on earth. <clears throat> so, so moving on there in verse 23, it says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Now is that not that's that happens all the time with JWs, right? The yeah. Jehovah Witnesses. I mean they even as recently as like the late seventies they're saying, Oh Jesus was here. You know, but it was in the secret chambers. Only we could see him. You know, that's not how it's gonna be. You know, and if any man says that, believe it not, you know, and mark that man and avoid him, he's a heretic. Yeah. yeah. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So it's not po if it were possible, they would be deceived. But guess what? It's not going to be possible Amen. for God's people to be deceived. Now, that's an amazing verse. When we kind of stop and think about what's actually going to take place, because I believe this is specifically referring to what's going to take place during you know, the Great Tribulation, that there are going to be false prophets and false Christ, and they shall show great signs and wonders. I mean, you think about the, the abilities that Satan's going to give to these people. What exactly all they're going to be able to do? I don't know. But, uh, you know, we can only wonder. He says in verse 25, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, is he in, the, he is in the, the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Uh, for as, as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even out of the west, so also shall the son of the coming, uh, coming of the Son of Man be. Now I've always wondered about verse 27, exactly what it means by that. A lot of people will ask, you know, you know, when Jesus comes, does come, are we, how are we, you know, the Bible says that we're all going to see him, obviously. Right. So, you know, a lot of times, the flat, this is where the flat earthers come in and say, well, that's why the earth has to be flat. <laughs> you know, because if Jesus comes in the clouds, everybody has to be able to see him at one time. You can't see it if the earth is around. It's like, no, that's not how it works, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, what does he mean there, for as the lightning? I'm sorry, you brought up flat earth. <laughs> he says, for as the lightning cometh out of the east, right? Now, when you first read that, I think, I, I always get the, the idea that maybe Jesus is going to come, you know, and come across the skies of the earth. You know, do, do, we, do we behold him all at once? Does every eye see him at the same time? I tend to think not. I think that he comes and those that are immediately present where he arrives see him. But it says, as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the Son of the man, uh, coming of man be. So I always got the impression that Jesus was going to kind of be moving across these skies. You know, that he might even come into the clouds and then circle the globe. You know, and who knows how long exactly that's going to take or how quickly he's going to move. To move. When it says, as lightning, you know, we have to then ask, well, is, is he referring, is he likening unto the sun or what we would call lightning today? Now, the Bible, and this is just me speculating here, okay? And I can't, this is just my opinion. This is me just wondering. You know, I have questions, too, about the Bible. And it says here, the Bible uses lightning as we would understand it today. You know, there's a lot of verses, if you go look up lightning, it's, it means like a thunderbolt. But the way he uses it here in this verse, at lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, right? It kind of sounds like the, su at, at like, like the sun, how the sun would move. And so that's kind of what got me thinking about, well, maybe it means, you know, he's going to move across the skies, or maybe he stays stationary and the earth turns underneath him and, and everyone gets a chance to see him. It's interesting. How, how exactly is he going to come? You know, we see through a glass darkly. We don't understand. 
But one thing we do know is that he's coming. Amen. And that's really what matters. Now, exactly how that's all going to play out, we don't know. But it's, it's kind of fun to kind of think about those things and, and, and wonder about it. But I believe that maybe, you know, he'll slowly dawn on people over the course, you know, of a certain amount of time. I don't, I don't know exactly. Maybe he moves across the skies. Maybe we move underneath him. I'm not sure. But we, what we do know is that um, everyone's going to see him. All right. And really what this also demolishes is this idea of, uh, a secret rapture. Yeah. You know, that God, he's going to come and people are just going to disappear and, and no one's going to be explained why. Yeah. You know, they're going to be like, oh, it's aliens. Or they're going to say, you know, there's just this pile of clothes here. And, and, and where do these people go? Planes are falling out of the sky and all this stuff like that. Well, first of all, do you really think there's that many born again people? You know, like, like there's people just, you know, the whole world system is going to shut down. No. People are going to be running for the hills. People are going to be freaking out. They're not going to be. You know, wondering about these things, but here's the thing: they're going to know what happened. They're going to know it had something to do with the lightning shining out of the east and even out of the west. You know, it's got something to do with you know that 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 miraculous event. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be in secret. When people aren't, we're not just going to disappear. Or one, you know, our, our loved ones will be you know calling the police and saying, "Hey, I've got a missing person's report to file. It's been 24 hours. I haven't seen my." You know, my Bible thumping, whatever, you know, where they go, you know. It's like, no, they're going to know it has something to do with, you know, what's going on, the events of the right. world. It's not going to be a secret. He says in, uh, uh, well, we'll just move on here. Verse 28 says, For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, who's ever struggled with that verse? Yeah. I remember that one used to just throw me such a curveball. And when I heard it explain, I was like, oh, yeah. you know, it's like there's so many verses like that. We tend to overthink them, you know, like, man, it's a deep saying. What is he saying? <laughs> well, he's saying, you know, the car what is a carcass? It's a body, you know. We often think of it as something dead, but it could refer to just, you know, the ever says, you know, eat your carcass in church, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's saying wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Well, where do they where do they gather? They gather in the skies, right? right. That's where the body is going to be. Why is it that we're all going to be able to see him? And and it's going to be as lightning shining out of the even uh, out of the east, even under the west. So, uh, you know, why is that? It's because he's going to be in the skies, which is what it says in Revelation 1-7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. So, the reason why we're going to be, every eye is going to be able to see him, the reason why it's going to be as lightning in the sky, is because his body is going to be where the eagles are, which is in the sky. So, it's actually pretty kind of simple, a verse when we just break it down like that. So it's really just a reference to the fact that Christ is going to come in the clouds of the skies. And, you know, and that's, that makes sense when we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 9. I'll read it to you. It's, you know, when, when Christ gives his final commission to his, his disciples, and then, uh, you know, on the Mount of Olives, and it says that he, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, with, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Yeah. So he literally, I mean, what an, an amazing sight that must have been. To be standing on there, listening to the word, the final words of Christ on earth, and then just to watch him, you know. And I don't think it was like, you know, like that. I, I tend to think maybe, was he saying these things as he was going up? <laughs> right. You know, like kind of talking, they're just like, you know. That, if I did that I, in this room tonight, if I started to levitate, I'm sure you would pay attention to that word that came out of my mouth, right? You would just instantly perk up, right? So maybe it was something like that. Maybe it was just a way to, hey, let me get these guys' attention they understand what I'm saying here. So he's slowly ascending. Did he say it and then slowly descend? And then they forgot, what did he say? You know, but, there, but he says, what, what happens though? He, he goes up into a cloud. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. I tend to think it was very slow, maybe like if you let a balloon go, it goes up. And it says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So how is Jesus going to come? The same way he went. He's going to come in the sky. He's going to come in the clouds. And that's why, wheresoever the carcass is, there, there, shall, uh, there will also the, the, the eagles be gathered together. Because that's just speaking of the manner in which Christ is going to return, which is in the skies. So we see all that. And of course, we're talking, kind of getting into the beginning of the sermon. I've got to wrap this up here. But we're talking about how the seals are lining up. Matthew 24, you know, uh, Luke 21, Mark 13. If you take them, you lie them all side by side, you take Revelation chapter 6, it all lines up. Yep. Right, everything Jesus says, the progression of the seals, and then you get to the sixth seal, right? And it says in verse 29, <clears throat> Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So the, you know, the sixth seal what, what lines up with what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about the effects of the natural world. 
the, th the, the things that are happening in our natural things that we can see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavens. He's, he's saying there's going to be certain effects that take place there. And what's one of the first ones he noticed, he mentions there is the sun being darkened. Well, look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as slack cloth of hair. So again, it's just lining right up. Isn't it great the way the Bible just lines up? What's the next next natural effect? Well, Jesus said, The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, it goes on and says, The moon became as blood. Right? So that's the moon being darkened. And then what's the next effect that we see in the natural world? Well, Jesus said that the sun would be darkened, that the moon would be darkened, and that the stars shall fall from heaven. Look at uh, verse 13 of Revelation chapter 6. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. Now, people say, is that the literal stars that we see? Like, how could that be? Because those stars are many millions of miles away, and they're, you know, many of them are many times bigger than our own sun. You know, they would dwarf our own sun. So is it those suns that are falling to the earth? Are those the stars? No, I, I believe what he's referring to here are great, the hailstones that are coming, that they're you know, the comets and the meteors that are going to be falling yeah. on the earth at this time. Yeah. And it says, even at, And the stars of heaven fell down to the earth, even as a fig tree cast her figs. And then we see the heavens shaken. And it's, you know, when she's shaken of a mighty wind. Jesus said the heavens would be shaken. Revelation 6 says that when the stars falls, it's going to be like a, uh, a, what a fig tree cast at her on timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So we see a shaking in the heavens too. What all that entails, I'm not sure. <clears throat> then, then of course, uh, so we notice all these natural effects taking place in the sixth seal, all lining up with what Jesus has said. Now the important thing to notice about all this, all these seals and the way they line up with what Jesus said is the timing of everything. Notice when these specific events take place. When is the sun darkened? When is the moon darkened? When do the stars fall? When does that happen? Well, look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. It says there immediately after the tribulation. Of those days. That's when verse 6 happens, or verse uh, the sixth seal is opened. It's after the tribulation. I mean, that's the great thing about having the position of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, having a post-trib, pre-wrath rapture, is that we have a clear verse yeah. that says after the tribulation of those days, right? And it goes on to explain the second coming of Christ. The pre-trip crowd doesn't have that. Right. They can never turn you to a clear verse and say, before the tribulation. They can't do that. What they have is a lot of mental acrobatics. They have a lot of twisting and resting of Scripture. They have a lot of dispensationalism that they'll draw on. I mean, there's, that's why the pre-trip crowd so often goes to the to the ruckard to get them have them explain it. Because yeah. the ruckards have this elaborate, just over-the-top, just way of trying to explain the right. preacher of rapture. Yeah. Even so much so that those that have, uh, you know, wouldn't necessarily call themselves dispensationalists, but have bought into the lie, they have, they can't explain it, mm -hmm. of the, of the preacher of rapture. They bought into that lie. They can't explain it. They just believe it, but they need somebody else to explain it to them. Yeah. I mean, could, have I explained anything tonight that you couldn't have just picked up on your own Bible reading? No. I mean, I've met people in churches like this, and, you know, in our own church, in other churches, they came to this realization long before they ever heard of Pastor Anderson. Long before the, the film After the Tribulation was even made. You know how they got there? They read their Bible. Right. Oh, they picked man. it up and read those words after the tribulation. Right. And it, it just makes sense. And they sat down with a friend and they studied out for themselves. They compared uh, the scripture with scripture and said, yeah, the pre-trib rapture is a lie. The pre-trib rapture has no clear verse to stand on. None. Not one single verse. They have a lot of just twisting and just a lot of uh, you know, just false document that they stand on. You know, they have the notes of Scor... Uh, I'm sorry, I keep dogging Scorby like that. I can't do that. <laughs> What's that other guy? Schofield. Schofield. It's that SC in the beginning. Yeah. Isn't it, right? <clears throat> anyway. So, that's when these events happen, after the tribulation of those days. So these events happen after the tribulation, and what happens after that? What happens after the sun and moon are darkened? You have the tribulation... You have these, uh, these profound, you know, just amazing events taking place. The sun not giving its light, the moon not giving its light, stars falling from heaven, the heavens being shaken, you know, being rolled back as a scroll and, and elsewhere. And, and what happens after that? We have the second coming of Christ. Look there in verse 30. It says, and then, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
So that happens after the six the six seals open, which happens after the tribulation that we've read about. Yeah. And if that is not a perfect description there in verse 31 of him sending forth his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, right? And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. That sounds like the rapture to me. I mean, what is that if that's not it? Yeah. Right? Is that a second rapture? You know, you talk to some of these dispensations, they'll tell you there's like seven different raptures. They have all this just convoluted, confusing way of trying to explain things. And you know what's what's dangerous about it is that you have to go to them for yeah. them to explain it. You have to go read Peter Ruckman's book to get an idea of what they're talking about. You gotta go read some other man's writings. You know, I remember when we first came to this truth and we tried to share it with somebody, and, and, and it said and we were just showing them what the Bible says and just explaining to them this is hey, look, it all lines up. They they just got frantic. At one point they're just literally like this, just like this can't be true. Just like that much. <laughs> I'm not an actor. This is like, no, no, this just can't be true. And a few days later, came back with some book this thick written by some other man. Full of words. You know, first you have to go under, try to wrap your head around uh, the type of words that man's even using, like these theological terms, before you can even begin to understand something about as important as the second coming of Christ. Huh. You think God wants his people in darkness about this topic? No. You think he'd make it hard enough to understand? Hmm. No, and that's why it's so easy to understand. Right. That's why, you know, we don't have to go deep on the second coming of Christ. I mean, there's a lot we could go deep on. Yeah. There have been a lot of great deep teachings. The Bible was very deep on the subject. But to just understand the basic timing of the rapture is easy, simple. And it's just comparing a couple chapters with one another, seeing the descriptions that's given there, and taking note of the timing. It's after the tribulation that we see the sixth seal. It's after that that we see the coming of Christ. So... <clears throat> Um, you know, all these events that are described in, in verses 5, five through 14, they, you know, they precede the revealing of the Antichrist in verse 15. You know, and then, that's the, and then you have the sixth seal, which precedes the coming of Christ, and then comes, you know, uh, and, then, and then the Antichrist is revealed, and, and it all, everything is just lining up. You see all this, and it lines up perfectly with uh, 2 Thessalonians. And if you would, turn over to uh, 2 Thessalonians. You know what, I'll just read you. It says there in 2 Thessalonians, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. So again, he's talking about the rapture here, right? The coming the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together unto Him. I mean, that is the rapture. Would you, would you not agree with that? I mean, but, yeah, yeah. I mean that no one's going to deny that this is talking about it. You know, if that's not the second coming, then what is it? And he goes on and says here that you shall not that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us uh, as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So when did we see the Antichrist come on the scene? When we were reading Matthew 24, what was that first seal? When it was you know when when there was wars and rumors of wars. When he that he was sat on a white horse and he went forth to conquer and conquering and to conquer, right? The the man of sin is revealed. Uh, you know the, the the antichrist he comes on the scene early and then you know when you see the, the, him standing in the uh, the the holy place, you know the, the abomination of desolation. Later, you know he's revealing himself. That's what this is referring to. When the man of sin is be revealed, you know when he who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. So what's another thing that has to take place before the coming of Christ? Because mm -hmm. we have to see the Antichrist right. revealed. And that doesn't happen until you get to the sixth seal. Right. That doesn't happen until much later into it. And of course we see, you know, uh, the, 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 the Antichrist early on, but it's not re he's not revealed as the Antichrist until later. Right. And that happens when he sets up the abomination of desolation, when he goes into the temple and declares himself to be God. You know, he makes peace with the Jews and then he goes back on the deal. And, and, and sets himself up as God. That's what this is referring to. You know, the Bible is telling us very clearly in verse 3, that day shall not come. What day is it referring to? The day of Christ. The day when, when he's going to come and, re, and, 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 to, and to receive us unto him. You know, the rapture. That's what it's referring to. Except uh, that day shall not come, except there come a falling way first, and that man of sin be revealed. Long before, you know, that, that verse has always been the one that stuck. And that was the first verse that I, when I read that, I was like, man, are you sure it's pre-trib? Because that doesn't sound like it. And I brought it up to that same pre-trib preacher who said, I just go along with the pre-trib to not make waves with people. I said, well, what about that verse? It sounds like, I said, it sure sounds like, you know, the, the Antichrist comes first and then Jesus. He said, it sure does. Huh. That's all I said. 
<laughs> and just left it at that. Uh, and just went on his merry way, being pre-trip. You know, or at least in, in at least giving the uh, letting everyone think he was pre-trip. I tend to think he wasn't. You know. Yeah. He wasn't a dummy. <laughs> so anyway, if you blew the trigger, you're not a dummy. Although I mean, uh, <laughs> that might explain it. Right? It's the fluoride working. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but really, the warning couldn't be, you know, more applicable to those today who, who teach a false pre-trib rapture. You know that we should not be deceived by these people. You know, there's a lot of people out there preaching this. And uh, you know, very quickly, I know I'm kind of going over here, so I'm, I'm trying to rush. And that's why, I, you know, it's kind of getting choppy here. But look at verse 32. It says, "Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors." Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now he's not talking about the generation he's talking to. He's not saying they, you know, these things are going to come to pass before you know, my twelve disciples die. He's saying the generation that these things come upon, that you know, it's going to happen in their lifetime. That's what that means. He says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of the hour, a day and hour knoweth no man. They'll say, well, you, go, you, know, you guys are saying you can tell when the rapture's coming. No, we're not saying we can tell. He said you can't, you know, the Bible says you can't know. It says you can't know the day and hour. But Jesus here is specifically, you know, exhorting people to pay attention and to understand yeah. that it is even, to know when it is at the doors. Yeah. That there are going to be a group of people that are going to see this Son of Man revealed and say, okay, we don't know the day and hour, probably because they're going to be in the midst of it. You know, it's kind of hard to keep track of time when you're in the Great Tribulation. I don't know that cell phones are going to be working. You know, you're probably not going to be, you're probably going to be more worried about trying to keep your head on your shoulders than, you know, yeah. keep track of days and, you know, you know where we're at on the calendar, but you're not going to be able to. So sitting down and counting isn't going to be a thing. And trying to do all the math and figure all that out, he's simply saying you won't know the day and hour. That's not to say we can't know when these things become uh, begin to come to pass. And he even gives us some clues here in this chapter. He starts to look. These are the type of things that are going to take place. And he says, as the days of Noah were, so also shall the Son of Man be, man, coming of man be. Whereas in the days of the, uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage. Eat until the day that Noah, Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also, so, so shall also the son of uh, coming of the son of man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one left, be, one be taken, the other left. Two men shall be grinding at the mill, but one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore. Now, why, why, if it's pre-trib, why do we need to watch? There's no need to watch. You know, Jesus can come at any moment. You can't watch for that. You know, they, He's saying, watch, you know, pay attention to things that are taking place. Look for, you know, when, when these things start to take place. Look, it's going to come upon some people as a thief in the night, but ye are not of, uh, of the darkness, but you are the light. You know, we are not children of the night. We are not going to be taken by surprise. He says in verse 43, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known uh, in, in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour. Not you know such a you know decade. You know, so such an hour. You're not going to know the specific day and hour, as you think that as the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a wise and faithful? Who is then as a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to him uh, to give him meat in his due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And what does he need to be doing? He's going to be watching. Yeah. You know, if you were given rule over someone's house, and the master is going to come back at any time, and check up on you and see how things went. You know, you're not going to just be letting the dishes pile up, not taking out the trash, you know, just loafing around the couch, you know, eating Cheez-Its and, and, and watching cable. You know, you're going to be, you know, because it's going to cost you your job. You know, right. You're going to get rebuked. You're going to get punished. You know, you're going to make sure the place is clean, everything's nice, orderly. It's going to be just the way you want. he's going to want to find it. So that's what he's saying here. Look, if you, you need, we need to watch and we need to live our lives in a certain way. Because no, we don't know the certain day and hour, but we need to continue to watch because we do know that there are certain things that are going to take place that are going to give us clues that we're going to be able to say, this has come to pass. I mean, why else do we have this chapter? Why would Jesus go to such lengths to describe all these events and give us all these, you know, understanding of, of the timing of things if we're not to uh, use that to help us to understand when these things begin to come to pass so that we would know to, to not be found slothful but to be doing the Lord's work. You see, the admonition here at the end that he gives is to understand the times and seasons. Though we don't know the day and hour, to understand the times and the seasons. Why? That we might watch and be found as a wise and faithful servant. Doing what? Doing the work of the Lord. So we need to just 
we need to make sure that we are people who are willing to do the work. That's what we need to be doing. And we need to be found doing that work. You know? yeah. We don't want to be caught unawares, you know. And uh, you know, that's the admonition here tonight. And, and for sake of time, we're just going to kind of end it there. But I did want to at least get to that point because there has to be some practical application here for our lives. I mean, it's great to understand and know the, the, the timing of the, of the rapture and when Jesus is coming and when he isn't. But really, we have to understand something is that, you know, there is a, a time of tribulation coming upon the earth. Right. And the whole pre-trib rapture, the, the reason why it's so popular is because people, Christians, they don't want to suffer any tribulation. And I have it here in my notes to go through it, but we don't have time. Of all the times that God in His Word has told us that we're going that going through tribulation is the very nature of the yep. Christian, Christian life. Yeah, right. All they that will live godly, uh, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Amen. Right. He said in verse Thessalonians 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for ye yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer, suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And that's why that pre-trib mentality is so popular. It's because they're like, oh, no, tri no tribulation? Sign me up. And that's why you know, hard truths, the Word of God, are not being preached. It's because they don't want, they don't want the nightly news you know, you know, catching them in the parking lot outside their church mm -hmm. and saying, do you still stand by your comments? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they don't want, they, they don't want that. They don't want to make those comments because they don't want to deal with the tribulation that will come upon us. Anybody that lives godly in Christ Jesus. But they're going to be, they're going to go through it one way or another. You know, that's the sad thing is they, they think they've got it all wrapped up and they're, they're on their way and Jesus right. could come, you know, at any moment and hopefully he comes tonight before anything, things get any worse and yada yada. But things, the Bible is very clear, things will get much worse yep. on this earth. Yep. Uh, and it's those servants who are being slothful, you know, and berating the other servants and, and treating them poorly. You know, oh, you, you post trade, you know, you, you guys are a bunch of, and you're the reason why, uh, you know, you're the one that, that's going to even cause the tribulation to take place to begin with. You're the reason why Christians are going to be persecuted. <laughs> you know, you're, yeah, you're drunken and, and, and berating us. You know, we're the good servants that are trying to just do the work, right. watch, to be wise, and to be found faithful. So let's continue to do that so when we know that Jesus comes, you know, we will be found doing the work. It's been